Hello and welcome to another edition of the Ian Dale Book Club podcast. I'm Ian Dale. Today we're going to talk about a very different kind of book because normally on this podcast, as you know, we talk about politics, we talk about current affairs, a bit of sport. Well, today we're going to talk about historical fiction. Um, Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, has written a new book called Her Heart for a Compass, which I think is a brilliant title for a book. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Um, Why why did you decide to change from writing children's books to this kind of book? Well, Ian, thank you very much for uh, having me on your podcast and hello, everybody listening. And I'm sorry, it's not a sports book or a financial (laughs) book or a political book. Well, you know, it's a book about uh, the uh, experiences and experimenting with the experiences of the heart and following uh, the truth or authentic truth of within yourself. So uh, it's uh, it's a really uh, interesting place for me to go. And I am a debut novelist and I'm 62 years old and I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today. the, the most important thing is that I've written 74 books and out of that two are historical coffee table type books uh, with Biden, and Nixon are based on young Victoria. Oh, sorry, the Queen Victoria and Albert. And then I made the film, The Young Victoria. Yeah. And uh, then the children's books. And I wrote uh, 10 uh, self-help books uh, because, of course, in the in my course of 35 years in public life, I've, I've been ups and downs and rounds and lots of different ways off a roundabout. And uh, I decided to uh, try my hand at uh, writing a novel. I have wanted to do it for 25 years, maybe 18 years. And uh, I thought I never could do this and I would never be a novelist, but I knew I had the vision to be able to do it. And uh, so I just uh, went into HarperCollins, uh, went up to uh, Lisa Milton and Rebecca Brooks and said, I think we should do a novel. And then I went to uh, to Mills and Boone and they very kindly uh, asked Marguerite Kay if she would help me, assist me to write this novel. So it really is a collaboration of uh, me not wanting to give up and me wanting to get Lady Margaret, my middle name's Margaret. I wanted to get Lady Margaret onto the page about a woman that follows her heart even though in 1870, everybody said that she was wrong, breaking the rules and breaking with the, what is then, what, what, what was then done in 1870 that she had to get, go off and get married to the person her father wanted her to marry. We'll come on to the main character in a, in a moment, but it's published by Mills and Boone. And I think people have an image of a Mills and Boone book, which actually I don't think this book really fits into in, in some ways. It's not the sort of classic Barbara Cartland style love story in a way. It is a proper historical novel. Ian, I take that as an enormous compliment. It is the first time that Mills and Boone have been on the Sunday Times bestseller list because of, of the detail and uh, the historical research that I did uh, in really loving each page, each line, studying the Crimea War. And it is a, it is a, her heart for a compass, it really is a, a testament to my heart of how I look at life every day. And I look at, and I smell and I feel. And so each line is a capturing uh, the slums of East End of London in 1870. You can imagine what it was like. Uh, then so going back to your point you just made, it's not a regular Mills and Boone book. I think that was what my challenge was. I think, you know, I, I spend my life being stigmatised or put in a certain box as being redheaded and rather strange and uh, eccentric and all these other kind of things. Uh, but I'm intensely serious about joy. I'm intensely serious about life. And I really, uh, being a redhead, you're always from 62 years you're always either carrot top or copper knob or whatever else they want to call you and so you you know I suppose that's why I support the LGBTQ plus group big time and I wish I could be I said you know do the award the rainbow awards tonight but I it's because it was the it's the place when I went to made a speech the other day I got up on stage and I thanked everybody there because I said it's the only place I don't feel judged that I can be creative that I can be myself and be able to speak out of in everybody else's eyes as this weirdo, but I'm just me. 
And uh, so, yes, when Mills and Boone said, well, we'd love to publish it, and Rebecca Brooks is a great supporter of Mills and Boone, I, uh, I was really proud that uh, I was representing a company that has been around 100 years, that has helped women through World War One, World War II. And really, I stand really proud uh, about the fact that during the pandemic, I was able to write a novel, which took my mind away from the situation. And I threw myself into the pages, very similar to what Mills and Boone does with the escapism for people. Has this whole experience been a bit of an escape for you? Because I mean, I was very struck of your self-description there, that you think people see you as a weirdo. Um, <laughs> do you really think that? Well, I, I think, uh, I don't know this word weirdo. I think, I don't really know what it means, actually. <laughs> Maybe I should look it up. <laughs> but the, the, what I think is that I love to, you know, Frank McCourt once said with Angela's Ashes, I said, how do you see life? And he said, oh, well, I don't see the seasons as a thing. I see the blossom trees as pink trees as, and the autumn I see as orange and gold trees. And he said, I suppose it's my childish way that I always look at life uh, with this sense of great color. And I, I do, I look at it like that. Everything seems to be a story. I don't know, uh, Ian, if you ever sit in a cafe somewhere and you watch the world go by and you make up stories as you go, who's doing what, what's happening there and why did that person go that way and not that way? And so I see life as an adventure. I see it as a story. I, I, I really love, love what I do, but it can be seen as different. Yeah, I think the word that I think most people would associate with you is not weirdo, it's actually fun. You, you Even though you've had some deep troughs in, in your life, you, you always, when I see you meeting people, you always look as if you have this enormous sense of fun. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why when you said, well, well, don't worry, we'll only keep, keep to 20 to 25 minutes. I thought, no, we won't. We'll go on for hours if you want to. I don't, I, I, it's <laughs> oh, just don't that tell me, of... some of my podcasts are two hours long. That's a really bad thing to say to me. <laughs> <laughs> We'd get on very well here. But it, well, it's only because you love what you're doing. And I'm not sitting here talking to you about a book. I'm here with my heart talking to you. And it happens to be we got on here because of the book. But actually, there's so many different things that... Uh, that's I, I suppose that's why I do children's really uh, because when I'm in reading story time or I'm right oh, I'm little kitty could you see if little red and little blue are around um, and when I'm wherever I go like on the borders in Poland now and I've invented a thing called planar box here because I think to myself if a child's coming over the border and you've just been in a bunker for in a cellar for five days with rats and it's freezing cold and and there's no no you can't see anything you're not gonna, you're only, you're four or five. You, you, your mom's crying, dad's at war. You don't know what on earth's going on. You need to escape into a coloring or a, 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 somebody's given you a wrap or a cap or a football and you can play football with your mates. And so I've invented a thing called planar box, which is so you could do cricket in a bag if it's in India or, or wherever, or it doesn't have to be on the borders of war zones. It can be anywhere. And you get your little box and out of it comes um, any character. This is little blue, actually. I invented him in 1992 and uh, he was for the children of Poland then. And, uh, Should and say for those, is... for those listening, um, so I was holding up two, I d how do I describe them? They're, they're sort of um, <laughs> dolls, aren't they? S yes, sort of. They're, they're rag dolls. Yeah. And they, they stand at um, 15 inches each. Uh, for those, sorry, I forgot people are listening and um, not just um, looking. Oh dear. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's actually very important because the other day, Ian, I did a really, really wonderful, I really enjoyed it. It was for the RNIB and I really had a lovely time and it made me uh, go off and decide to write little red and little blue into braille books because I thought we must do more for the visually impaired. And, and so anyway, I'll describe it then. So little blue, he is, uh, he wears dungarees. He has a bee on top of his bonnet, not in his, on his bonnet, on his bonnet, not in his bonnet because I thought that was funny. And uh, Little Red, uh, she was invented to save the lives of children from the Oklahoma City bombing. 
and little beer was invented to save the lives of children in Poland. And uh, little red was the only object to survive the North Tower of 9-11 because my, I started a foundation to, to help the children of Oklahoma City to thank the American people for giving me so much of my life. They gave me a great job for 12 years and it really helped me after I got divorced. And, uh, and so I said, thank you to America with Little Red. And Howard Lutnick of Cantor Fitzgerald gave me an office on the 101st floor of the World Trade Center. And Little Red came down from 101 floors and she was found in the rubble. Wow. And CNN filmed it and said, look at Charles Doll." And Larry King said, no, 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 that's Fergie's Little Red. And she stands for children's rights all over the world. And if you go to Ground Zero Museum now, you see her in a glass case like Sleeping Beauty. And it says the only object. So Little Red is going to uh, Croatia next week. And she's going to bring out Play in a Box by Little Red. You've had to reinvent yourself a lot over the years. And I mean, just in that five minutes there, you, you, you've described about five different things that you've got involved with, that you've invented, that you've started. It, do, do you quite enjoy that process and sort of every so often thinking, OK, I'm going to do something new now? I mean, write, writing a novel is, is the latest example, I guess. Well, uh, good question, Ian. I'm very positive. So the minute that I make a ginormous mistake, whatever it might be, not when I didn't follow my heart, didn't listen to my instinct, uh, is the minute that I re re restock and I go, hmm, why did you do that? Why didn't you listen to yourself? Why didn't you understand and read the room better? Weren't you a bit tone deaf at that time? And perhaps you could learn. So then you go seek help and you say, look, I've made a major mistake and I'd like to learn how to forgive myself and move on, but also forgive who, whatever, whoever, whatever happened and just put it behind us and move on. And in learning that, it, it sort of frees you up more to create something else in my case, because I think, I think wearing a hair shirt all the time with you, you know, you ponder, you plod around carrying so much weight of so many different things you could have done differently. Uh, it just really doesn't really get you anywhere. Do you feel that maybe sometimes you're too trusting of people? You see, you see the best in people and without wondering necessarily what their motives were, but are. Because when you are a member of the royal family, when you've been a member of the royal family, there are lots of people who want a bit of you and they, they want a bit of you for their own maybe selfish reasons. Do, do you think that that's been a problem over the years where, where you've trusted people that maybe did, shouldn't have had your trust? Uh, Ian, uh, <laughs> so I'm putting you. I'm putting you on the couch. No, you're moment, not. Aren't I? No, no. I was about. <laughs> no, no. You're absolutely right. No, I was about to answer you with, "Well done, knowing me so well." I, do you know what it is, Ian? I am far too trusting, and my girls call me. I'm like a big puppy dog, a Labrador. You know, be mm. kind to me, and I'll. You know, and, and I literally. fall into. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I fall into so many traps. Uh, well, and in the past more than now, because I maybe have learned at last, but it's because I don't look at, I cannot, I, you know, I asked a first responder the other day, Ian, I said, how do you go in, to, you're a firefighter, and you go in and see the most incredible, terrible situations, how is it you're not so traumatized by what you see? I, I, I just couldn't, I just, I mean, I just couldn't do it. And he said, well, I couldn't go up on a stage and talk to a thousand people. Uh, I don't know how you do that. And I suddenly realized that actually I, I couldn't do it because I, my mind's not trained like that. His mind is not trained like my mind. So everybody's mind's different. So uh, my mind is not trained that someone's trying to set me up or someone's trying to mm. trick me because I believe and I have compassion and I believe I could not do that to another. Therefore, I naively, yes, I agree, um, fall into the traps because I think, well, no one could be like that. No one would be cruel like that. And now I found out the hard way, didn't I? Yes. And I, th I think it's something that in a sense comes with age and that I, I always say, I didn't know myself until I was 50. 
which sounds sounds an odd thing to say in a way but I think by the time you get to 50 you realize what you're good at what you're not good at and it, in a also in a sense you become slightly more cynical as you get older and you do start you learn from experiences where you have been exploited by people who you had thought a lot of but they, they let you down is that something that you've experienced that the older you get the more streetwise you get hold on a minute i need to think about my answer uh i i would like to believe that I am at that place right now, Ian. Yes. I don't, I, I think it's sad I have to think so hard before walking into a room, mm. before making, for opening my big mouth yeah. and, and making a mistake. I've, I find it sad that I have to, to be like that because it means that I'm having to edit and script myself, uh, which I never have done. Uh, but now I have to, you're absolutely right. Does that make me street? smart and yes I think it older wiser savvy and I'm not going to say the grow up word because I can't but you know I think <laughs> I might have to use the grow up word and and I think it's really interesting because I think social media makes it very very hard as well because there's so many troll warriors out there they all have a view they all either like it or they don't it's like marmite I 50% like you 50% don't you know mm. I it's it's tough so I think the only thing we can do is just carry on let's go back to the book because that is what we're here to talk about um the, the main character tell me more about her because she is based on somebody real and someone that was your ancestor that's right can I just say because I know you'll edit it and cut it and everything Ian you've got a great voice you do really well <laughs> you're doing really well and you're such a nice person why are you such a nice person oh now don't start interviewing me this is always what happens in these in these interviews oh, that, okay. that it, it comes back to me and it's not it's not about me but um look i mean i i like to think i i sort of do good interviews because i i don't do them as interviews i do them as conversations and that's what exactly. we're having now a conversation mm -hmm. rather than me mm -hmm. saying well sarah ferguson justify yourself on this and i mean that doesn't get you anywhere does it I mean, if i had started off with that you would have planned up right from the start <laughs> probably no no probably not probably i would have gone <laughs> oh a challenge <laughs> 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 anyway back to your main character okay sorry 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 yes okay yep so i um I, I actually decided that um how is it that i can laugh i can play and i have this sense of of uh really just life i love it so i researched back to find my ancestors who had red hair and who were very strong and had it must be in my dna because it's just natural for me to have the joie de vie i just naturally have it i just love it and uh the puppy dog you know and uh so i in researching back okay it went all the way back to the 15th century where there was a redhead who was incredibly uh, similar to me and then i went all the way forward and I found Lady Margaret and Lady Margaret Montague Douglas Scott uh, from my grandmother's family. Great and of name. course, isn't it? Isn't <laughs> it cool? And uh, and also because uh, my her, she had five brothers, I think, and they were all written about, but no one had bothered about the woman, Lady Margaret. And so I sort of, of course, uh, took her, realized that she's a relative of mine. So therefore, let's make her more like me. Uh, poor lady <laughs> and then uh, see there you go again I'm sorry <laughs> there you go again so sort of saying poor her why, why I mean in I think in many ways a lot a lot of women in particular maybe a lot of uh, redheads look at you as a bit of a role model in, in some ways and yet y you're sort of slightly downplaying the I think the image that you have with a lot of people yeah and I, I think that comes from uh, I think I've still got a long way to go on the mental side of it. I've um, still got to be kinder to Sarah. I'm very kind or to myself. Sorry, I don't want to put the Sarah word, but to, to be kinder to myself and not say comments like that and don't call myself a weirdo. I've got to stop that. And um, I think that's it's a work in progress. I think I'm a good a canvas that is still being painted. And so therefore... You're right. Good catch, Ian. Good catch. <laughs> uh, the the lady. I do think it's. I do think it's interesting uh, that 
to learn to receive and to forgive yourself. And I think that Lady Margaret had to, in the book I write about that because I have to do that myself. And uh, when someone smiles to you, receive the smile. Don't mm. just go, oh, that's nice. Or you know, receive it and, and understand there are many people out there that, uh, that, you, that you don't want to let them down by punishing yourself too much. And uh, then you turn into victim and all that. So that's not me, but... But I, I do think that was a good catch, Ian. Thank you. I'll learn from that. <laughs> Something you just said there again, and we're, we're veering off the character again, but um, you said um, let people down. Do you, do, is that a constant fear that you, 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 you feel that you do let people down? No, I don't intentionally ever, ever, actually. Uh, but if I do then um, I don't like that for th that I have. And so I, I don't think that's something that I go out of my way. I have no intention of, um, uh, uh, sorry, someone just, I have no, inten my intentions are always from my heart. And actually we're not really deviating from the book, Ian, because uh, my character, Lady Margaret in the book is, uh, is very true to, how I felt when I started writing the book, very lacking in confidence, thinking I couldn't do it. And you see, as Lady Mar as you get more into Lady Margaret, she grows in confidence and then goes off to New York and America. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what I did. And uh, so I think it's quite exciting, uh, Ian, that my confidence has grown from learning and achieving a novel. Now I've finished my second book, and that comes out in February. And I am I'm very interested that my character in the second book, again, is a relative of mine, is even more confident than Lady Margaret. So my third book, which I'm now starting, um, is now me now, who you're talking to. And I wonder, um, I think she's, oh, I don't know what I'm going to get her to do. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's pretty exciting that I can, uh, that I feel more happy uh, right now than I've ever felt actually in my life. Well, you're about, I think, three novels. That almost makes you prolific. Is that is that now where you see yourself sort of maybe concentrating on, on writing novels for the next few years? Yeah. Yes, I love it. I love it. For, for example, I decided to learn French, Ian. Why? <laughs> I mean, if you're going to learn a language, why French? Uh, because I, it brings happy memories back of my best friend at school. And so I was taught French well at school and I'd forgotten it. So I decided to learn it. And anyway, I like France and I like to go to the markets and to Provence and to walk in the sun with the sunflowers. And, and so I decided it would be a good thing to do. And so my heroine in my next book, of course, is going to go from England to France. And then maybe I could do, because I'll be so fluent by then, I can do all the interviews in French. <laughs> Why not? Good luck with <laughs> but that. also, I also would love to uh, make. I think French film and television is very good, actually, and uh, and I think that her heart for a compass should be made into a TV series. Well, I think it actually could be um, because I think there is a real appetite now for historical drama. I mean, you, you look at. I don't know if you watch it, but um, the Gentleman Jack on a Sunday evening yes. at the moment with Sir Anne Jones, which I have to say I can't stand, but my partner makes me watch it while we're having Sunday dinner. And um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, when I knew that I was going to interview, I did think to myself, well, there, there are a few parallels here. It's a similar time period. Um, and I think it's absolutely ideal for television. But how do you do the... I mean, it is a novel, but you've clearly done a lot of research into the to get the to get it right from a historical viewpoint. How long did that take, and how, what was the process? How did you do it? Well, I, I'm very lucky to have um, an amazing lady called Sue, and she lives about ten minutes away. But she has she just devours books. I mean, literally devours books, any kind of book. She just is an extraordinary. I call her my walking library. And uh, she's just gold dust because I say, OK, so um, we're at East End. Uh, we, uh, we've just got out of our carriage. And uh, what, would be, what would be happening then and there? You know, uh, so would there be, where would the slums be? Where would the, the sewers be? Where, what would happen? 
you know, and so she then goes and researches every single movement from when I get out of the carriage and with the skirts and I put my little lavender nosegay up to my nose because all that diddly dee diddly dee. And, and so then she sends me the relevant chapters to read on exactly that bit of history on that day, on that week, in that year. And then I'm able to get the colour and the feeling and and absorb myself into the history of it. And then, of course, that may, helps me to learn history as well. It's fascinating. Did, did you know that you have something in common with Anne Widdicombe? Because she does. She When she writes her novel, she does exactly what you're doing. She did a, um, a love story called An Act of Treachery, and it was set in Second World War Paris. Now, obviously, she didn't know anything about Second World War Paris. And she said to me what? She said, the thing that I dread most in writing a novel is that I have a chiming clock. I said, what on earth do you mean by that? And she said, well, Shakespeare, in one of his books, I can't remember which one it was, had a chiming clock. I, I, I think it was, uh, it was one set in ancient Rome. And it had a chiming yeah. clock. And of course, there were no chiming I'm writing clocks. That in down, so, yeah. <laughs> there were no <laughs> chiming clocks in ancient Rome. So even right. Shakespeare got it wrong. And so she also talked to lots of people who were around in Second World War Paris to make sure that she didn't have a chiming clock in her book. And it sounds as if it's the same approach that you're taking. That is a huge compliment uh, because that that means that that is. I thought that was that's really good because it means that not only is it not a chiming clock, but you you sort of look at uh, like like Bethlehem, like Bedlam, yeah. right? Is Bethlehem Hospital actually? But they just went, "You've done Bedlam," you yeah. know, and and actually, then I wanted to know, right? Well, what happens in Bedlam, and how did you, what went on? And no, 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 no. I I need to know. So I. I actually thought you meant chiming clock is come on the publisher wants the book no nope, because nope. By no, the we, time we all I've have that one. <laughs> oh Ian and but the, you know because I absorb myself so much into wanting to know about no no but why did they go to Bedlam and mm. what happened and ah you know and and that sort of sense of of, of just you know, wanting to know and that's why uh, I did the film Young Victoria because uh, I thought well heavens there's such a beautiful love story between Albert and Victoria. Why has no one done the love story? And no mm. one had, but that's why I did it. But, but also now I'm fascinated because um, my next thing I'm doing, um, Ian, is uh, I'm fascinated why if zero to five of a child's mind, I'm a grandmother, two grandchildren, if zero, and I have really good girls, if zero to five of a child's mind is formed by good mothering or good parenting at, at that time, like, Prince Albert had a great mother, very young, who taught him music, laughter, happiness from zero to five. And then she was taken away and on her way to a mental institute because her husband didn't want her. Hmm. And so I'm fascinated in Prince Albert's mother, Louise, that nobody's done anything about. So I think that'll be my next film, which will be this great exhibition starting with Albert's great achievement for Britain, which we see till to today with the Royal Horticultural Society, with Imperial College London, all that's, you know, everything he achieved, b everything. And how did he do it? Died at 41, 42, and he, um, and he achieved the great exhibition. So I, I think my film will start with his achievement and then take it back to the history of how his mum was always in his heart. I've got another idea for you for a book. Okay. Um, when I was watching the ITV series on Queen Victoria, I thought one of the most interesting characters was actually her mother, who... Um, oh, yes. I can't even remember her name now, but she had this really, that really weird relationship with one of the courtiers who seemed to control her. And I thought, I mean, that would make a brilliant subject for a sort of... a. a a kind of well it's kind of faction isn't it not fiction and not fact yeah. it's mixing the two I suppose a bit like the whole Queen Victoria series in a way in a way does but I thought she was a fascinating character well she, she absolutely was so fascinating that that that's why she was determined to have big, her have her baby uh, on British soil so imagine six weeks in a carriage being thrown around with with being pregnant but she managed to hold Victoria all that way just so that she could be born on British soil. 
So she could be, well, I mean, she knows she was going to have a girl, but she, the child could be the future. And she, and I think that's extraordinary. But also um, the other thing about her is that they did fight all of the time mm. and she was over controlling for Victoria. But then if you go just down the road for five miles, you see the most enormous mausoleum to the Duchess of Kent and 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 you see everything that Victoria did to honor her mother. And and I find that fascinating. And I agree with you, Conway is a, a very serious uh, subject matter. And I think uh, that thank you very much for that idea, Ian. You'll have to help me with it. Well uh, if you if you do it, I'm on to credit in the in the forward. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, but actually gentleman Jack, it, I, it's rather like did you remember seeing the film The Favourite? I haven't seen it, no. No, it's just, it, I just sort of wish they wouldn't go quite so off piece. You know, if you're, it's such a good story and mm. it's a true story and the diaries, but just don't go too much into the bonkers because it, then I, I, for me, from my side of it, I can't, I want to follow the storyline and uh, it suddenly jumps around a bit too much, I think. And, uh, but I can understand what they're trying to achieve. Let's talk a little bit about um, your two daughters, because obviously they're, they're both married now. One, one of them's got two, as you said, two two children. Um, does it feel weird to is that word, word again? Does it feel weird to you being a grandmother? Um, actually, um, I'm going to ask someone. Could you just look up the word weirdo or weirdo? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so Ian, just quickly, um, I I have. My average age is three to six, isn't it? My children's books. What does it say? You have to read it to me. I haven't got my glasses. So it's a person whose dress or behaviour seems strange or eccentric. Oh, well, there you are. Did you hear that? <laughs> I did. No. Did you? Okay. I did, yeah. Oh, you did hear it. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, oh, there are my glasses. Yes. Uh, a person whose dress or behaviour seems strange or eccentric. The streets are dangerous and there are too many weirdos around. Oh, well. I don't think anyone's thought like of you as dangerous, have they? No. Um, so, <laughs> exactly. So, Ian, um, my girls are, uh, we call ourselves the tripod. We are just a, so lucky. I have a great, really uh, phenomenal uh, relationship with them. And Beatrice always says to me, Mum, you know, I want Sienna and I to have the same relationship as you and I have. And I said, well, the secret of what I did with you was, A, I never forgot that once I was a teenager and slammed the door. Uh, two, I think that you, you have to remember that when children are very little, they talk about their fears as dragons. When they get to teenagers, they go slam the door and they don't know how to express this anxiety feeling inside of them and puberty mm. and going through this, which is why I do the teenage cancer units. Uh, and have done for, for 30 years actually I think it's 29 units opened in 30 years and uh, it's because I love to spend time with the teenagers that are going through uh, puberty and adolescence and then get cancer and then the nurses and doctors come in and say oh we know how you feel no you don't know how they feel because you've forgotten mate go back and remember what it's like you, you lose your voice and so we uh, the Teenage Cancer, Adrian and Myrna Weinson and the Teenage Cancer Trust started these units on, and the first hospital we opened was in Middlesex Hospital, I'll never forget it. The nurses were in blue jeans and Doc Martens and there was music and walls were painted and, and the teenagers, I think it was about a 14 bed uh, unit at the time, they were allowed to be, express themselves and they played pool and in just the atmosphere changing, the, of course the cancer uh, is positive cancer doesn't like positivity uh, and so the reason why I said that Ian is because your question was uh, how do you uh, relate to your grandchildren I I think you just be present you don't rush in the door and put your hands out and say oh have a cuddle well hold on a minute the little they're just eight months old and 15 months old they're probably going oh who's that you know just be gentle be still sit quietly and wait for them to explore to see who who this older lady is in the room or whatever. So I have a really lovely time with them, uh, and um, I'm there as much as they wish or not. 
and I, I suspect, I mean, you went through what every other parent goes through when you, you clearly have a very close bond with both your daughters. And, and when they, they eventually flew the nest, I mean, was that a quite a difficult adjustment for you to make? Because I think it, I, I know my mother, I mean, I've got two sisters and one of my sisters stayed around and, and lived very close to my parents. But um, I think all parents find that adjustment very difficult where you spend 18 years or 20 years or however long with them as a constant presence. And then suddenly they're not there anymore. Oh my gosh. And it was, I, I think I cried uh, when they got engaged. I, I, Cause I suddenly, my babies, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I'm very open with it with them about it and now I've understood that they create their own islands and they have to create their own islands and um, but it did take me quite a long time because I of course as you know now from this interview and with the amount of children's books I've written my children are my everything and uh, I love playing with them and love having fun with them during the day and in the evening now I mean it's quite useful with Jack's uh, Jack, when he got engaged and married to Eugenie, of course, worked for a tequila company, which helps enormously. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was an arranged marriage, you chose well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my pod fell out. Um, and wait, hold on here. Coming back. Oh. <laughs> and then I've known... Oh, thanks, Kitty. I've known Edo, uh, Beatrice's um, husband, uh, since he was born, because uh, his... Uh, his brother's my godson and and uh, so we're very close and it's kind of that's that's really good because he was my friend before they got married so uh, I can say to him hey son-in-law or friend and I think one of the things that I really admire about you is the way that um and I'm slightly straying onto private territory here so tell me to shut up if you want but I think the way that um you and Andrew have managed to maintain a, a good relationship since the divorce because that doesn't happen with everybody does it and and I think that clearly that's been I think your 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 daughters have both probably really appreciated the fact that you you have been able to remain close I I, I he's he's a very very good and very kind man he really is and uh, and he 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 really understands the art of communication uh, with me and and trust and uh, the three C's communicate. Wait, hold on, hold on a minute here. Errol, can you show Ian? I want, to, this is Errol. He's definitely Errol Flynn. Uh, for, the, for anyone I listening. I sense a dog moment and I was right. And you are, well, yeah, I hardly had Errol Flynn on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> and what, 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 breed is, what breed is Errol? Norfolk Terrier. Fantastic. Why does everyone show you their dog? Uh, well, they know that I love dogs. I have two of my own, a miniature schnauzer and a Jack Russell. So, um, oh, okay. So, so it was okay. We, we've, bond, we've bonded already. Yeah, but he's a Norfolk Terrier with a black coat on. Is that so unusual? it looks like he's got a little blanket on. He doesn't at all. <laughs> anyway, he is mine. And uh, he is, um, uh, of course, he's Errol Flynn, because swashbuckling. Anyway, so uh, what was I saying? We were talking about your relationship with Andrew. Oh yes, and so you know he's a very he's a very good, very kind man, and uh, and I we we really do com communicate, compromise with compassion. So I I will stand by stand by him, and uh, and just it's an incredible friendship, and and not just co-parenting it's just real you know it's just real and see, um, I thank goodness they the girls have got well, he's you know growing up very in sort of naval and this is how it's done and very royal life and then they have the the river running by which is me again you're going to probably want to switch the camera off now but there's a lot of people when I've talked about you to people over the years They've all said, well, I say they've all, some have said, I just wish they'd get back together and have a happy ending. <laughs> yeah, how funny is that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> everybody says that to me too. <laughs> uh, the, the, the thing is, I don't know whether I, 
I think the happy ending really is, I mean, I mean, really our, our fairy tale happy ending mm. is the way we are today and uh, the way we lead by example w with the ability to have the sense of understanding of each other. I don't think I would ever wish to go into anything where I can't just jump around and be a sense of freedom. And I think that is the, the key mm. to it, is that I love to be free. I, I really do. And it's, a, I don't know, it's, I suppose it's because I like to go to Poland tomorrow if I wish to, or if I want to go to, uh, to Rwanda. Oh, goodness, I think I was meant to be in Rwanda. And, uh, you know, I just, I just love the way I am. So I think this is, the, this is a good fairy tale ending. We're recording this the day before the Jubilee celebrations start. Um, you, you're in a slightly odd position because you've sort of got one foot in the royal family and one foot out. Um, will, will you feel part of the celebrations? And I mean, I mean, it's an amazing thing that for, for all of your life, for all of my life, we've never known anything else other no. than the Queen. No. I mean, she, apart from our siblings, she's the only constant in our whole lives, isn't she, in a way? And mm -hmm. it is such a remarkable achievement. Well, it, absolutely, it, it, that, that is slightly nerve wracking, isn't it? Long may she reign, you know, she has been in all our lives. I mean, mm. and uh, I, I'm asked a lot uh, by people who is my most extraordinary, iconic, a uh, legendary person and I always say the Queen because it it's and it sounds however anyone wants it to sound but for me um, I'm lucky enough to just absolutely honour, adore, um, never met anyone like like Her Majesty in my life I mean she's just you can't explain her. Has she been kind to you? Oh I mean i I always say I am the luckiest girl alive because uh, the most extraordinary example of love, kindness, forgiveness, and uh, understanding. Understanding. She, she's, she's. I suppose that's where Andrew gets his understanding too. Is is there? Is just, just no judgment. Just, just mm. kindness. It's, I'm very lucky. Yeah. Do Do you still get very? frustrated angry annoyed about how sometimes you're portrayed in the media or does it just wash off your back now oh no never oh my gosh I'm the most stratospherically oh, stratospherically sensitive person you'll ever meet and I mind desperately what I've what I do now is um when it it's it's very strange to say but it's sort of I realise because a lot of people get a lot of with, through the cyberbullying and trolling and all these things that that I, I I sort of understand now that I'm not the only person that that you know is being completely mm. obliterated or whatever, and I think it's becomes from uh, when Diana and I went we went through that period where we were just the two of us really who. One day she was up and I was up and Saint and Sinner and all this. Yeah. And I think if we look back at some of the front pages that were written about either her or I, I think people would go, no, it's not possible. It didn't happen. And and so I think then I didn't get a thick skin, but I, I had to understand, stop trying to people, please. Stop trying to get everyone to like you. Be yourself. And they like, they can make a choice if they want to or not. So it's not that I, I do mind. I don't sell myself now. I don't say, oh, Ian, I didn't throw the apple at the whatever I meant to have done or something. I just keep going and uh, hopefully people can make their own mind up. But that's still, it still affects me and I still mind. And but then six o'clock, glass of wine, you know, get on with it. Did you know, by the way, that I was the boyfriend that Diana never knew that she had? because I used to, I bought a car, an Audi Cabriolet, which it turned out she used to own. And I used to get stopped by a paparazzi driving around Trafalgar Square with the roof down. And they'd literally stop the traffic and say, are you Diana's new man? Oh, how cool is that? <laughs> it was very cool. Oh, well, it's very nice to meet you, Diana's new man. 
<laughs> Listen, we will. I'll let I've you always, go now. I, I like men with bald heads. <laughs> well, well, there you go. Well, uh -huh. Is that a chat up line? <laughs> no, because you've got a nice partner that you sit and watch Gentleman Jack with. I do, I do. Um, <laughs> now, listen, I'm going to let you go because I know you've got another appointment. But um, just to say, uh, if you'd like to buy Sarah's book, it's called Her Heart for a Compass by Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York. It's now available in paperback at 8 99 published by Mills and Moon. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much. And Ian, it's been a great treat to talk to you too. And uh, and uh, again, thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll, we'll we'll speak again maybe when your next book comes out. Thank you.